Okay, welcome to our segment on 18th century art. Um, we're going to be kind of hopping around a little bit. We're going to look at some late um, Baroque English art. We're going to be looking um, at French Rococo art um, and some other movements, neoclassical art um, in, in France in particular. Um, the 18th century, um, or at least the beginning of it, is, is a really interesting moment. Um, it's, it's where the Industrial Revolution in England and France is starting to happen. Um, as we looked at with Baroque art, we see that there's a growing middle class that's forming. Um, and so there definitely is um, an art market that is really starting to develop. Um, you know, there's a middle class that really does want to collect art. And so art isn't just a uh, reserve for um, the aristocrats and, and royalty anymore. All right, so we'll look at British 18th century art. I do apologize. This picture I have is very pixelated. I'll replace it with a better one. Um, but for now, um, it should do. We'll be looking at an artist named William Hogarth. Um, and he did a series um, called Marriage a la Mode, which is pretty pretty much translate um, um, modern marriage. Um, it's a series of six pictures painted by the artist between 1743 and 1745, um, depicting a pointed um, skewering of the upper class, um, 18th century society. Um, so it's a, it's a moralistic painting that warns um, and shows the disastrous results of ill-considered marriage for money um, and sort of satirizes um, patronage and, and aesthetics. Um, his intent was to use these paintings as a model for, for prints um, he was going to produce and sell for about a shilling each. So again, this is um, really feeding into this idea of art as a commodity. Um, and also this idea that Hogarth as an, is, you know, is an artist entrepreneur, um, which is, is very much in line with this sort of notion of the artist that we have today. You know, artists sort of aligning themselves with a the gallery, um, selling their work, um, and, um, you know, there's definitely an art market. And so he really um, is, is, is taking advantage of this, of, of this definite um, rise of the middle class. In Marriage a la Mode, Hogarth challenges the ideal view that the rich live um, virtuous lives um, with a heavy satire on the notion of arranged marriages. Um, in each piece, he shows the young couple and their family and acquaintances at their worst. Um, engaging in affairs, drinking, gambling, and numerous other vices. This is regarded by many as one of his finest projects um, and certainly the best example of his serial planned story cycles. So in the first of the series, um, this is the first picture. It's entitled The Settlement or The Marriage Settlement. Um, he shows an arranged marriage between the son of a bankrupt earl um, and his daughter and the daughter of a wealthy but um, miserly city merchant. Um, construction on the earl's new mansion, visible through the window, has stopped um, and a usurer negotiates payment for further construction at the center of the table. Remember, a usurer is um, basically a banker who lends money out. Um, the Earl proudly points to a picture of his family tree um, rising um, from William, Duke of Normandy. So he's, you know, trying to kind of show off his status or his aristocratic um, heritage. The son views himself in a mirror, showing where his interest in the matter lies. So he's, he's kind of self-absorbed and doesn't really care. The distraught merchant's daughter is consoled by the lawyer's um, lawyer while polishing her wedding ring. Even the faces on the walls appear to have misgivings. So if you look at these kind of portraits, they're sort of kind of looking at, you know, it's almost like they're watching this event unfold and, and realize how disastrous this union is probably going to be. Um, two dogs chained to each other in the corner um, um, mirror the situation of the young couple. So, you know, this sort of idea of arranged marriages without love. This is the second in the series. Um, and um, this is the one that we're really going to focus on the most. Um, 
this is the one that you are responsible for in the AP list of 250 required works. So in the second series of paintings, um, the marriage of um, the Viscount and the merchant's daughter is quickly proving a disaster. Um, the tired wife, who appears to have given a card party the previous evening, is at breakfast in the couple's expensive house, which you can see is now in disorder. There's furniture knocked over and things lying on the floor. Um, the Viscount returns exhausted from a night spent away from home, probably at a brothel. The dog sniffs um, a lady's cap that is hanging in his pocket. So I'm kind of focusing over here. Um, and this is supposed to signify that um, he's, you know, has committed adultery and been with another woman. Um, the steward, their steward or their servant, um, is carrying bills and receipts um, and leaves the room um, and sort of has his hands sort of raised in despair at all the disorder that's going on in the household. Um, there's a small dog. Um, oh, I already mentioned that. The small, the small dog um, finding the, the cap in the husband's coat pocket. Um, there's a broken sword um, at his feet, at the Viscount's feet, um, and this indicates that he's also been in a fight and, and um, hasn't been acting like a good husband. Um, the open posture of the wife also indicates this sort of unfaithfulness. She appears to be signaling to someone out of view um, with a pocket mirror. So apparently she's been sort of up to no good and, and, and engaged in um, some adulterous activities as well. Um, this in the upturned chair indicate that her lover had to quickly perhaps, um, um, perhaps disturb during um, their little um, get together um, by the arrival of their husband. So the upturned chair is supposed to signal that he had to leave in a rush. Um, the disarray of the house and the servant holding a stack of unpaid bills, which I mentioned earlier, shows the affairs of the household are just disastrous and in quite um, disorder. Um, the decoration of the room also comments on what's happening in the picture and sort of the moralistic um, meaning. The picture over the mantelpiece over here shows um, Cupid among ruins in front of a bush with a broken, um, in, a, in front of a bust with a broken nose, symbolizing impotence. <laughs> so there are all these little details, um, you know, about this sort of, um, sort of disastrous um, arranged marriage that um, isn't working out too well. Um, the series of paintings is not received um, as well as some of his earlier um, sort of moral um, didactic um, paintings that he did before. Um, he, you know, the series wasn't very popular. Um, and when he did finally sell um, the series of pictures, which he did in 1751, it would be for a much um, lower sum than the artist had hoped for. So it's interesting, you know, again, this is. Um, sort of a new function in art. We're seeing these sort of genre scenes and um, the lives of ordinary people um, being depicted. Um, and also sort of the the negative um, lives um, of some people as well. So remember art and a lot of the art history periods that we looked at before was about sort of um, idealizing people um, and their accomplishments and, and here we're seeing art really shift and sort of looking morally at society um, and in some ways you know casting judgment as well so we see the function of art um, changing during this period all right so we're gonna go to France now we just spent a little time um, with um, English um, 18th century painting um, it's important that we do understand some important events um, in the history of French rule so that we can get a better understanding of the development of French painting during this time. So here's a list. Um, there's the death of Louis um, oh, 
the 14th. No, I'm sorry. It looks like the 19th um, and 1715. Um, and so here, you know, the monarchy was established by bloodline. And we'll see this idea of monarchy um, being questioned when we look um, um, later at um, neoclassical art. Um, there is a regency established um, um, in 1715 to 1723. Um, anyway, um, and then there's Louis oh, the 15th, um, who, you know, is married to Marie Antoinette um, from 1723 to 1774. Um, and then obviously we know the story of Marie Antoinette and, 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 and Louis. Oh, I'm sorry. Louis the 16th. Um, I'm sorry. Louis the 16th was married to Marie Antoinette and, um, he was sent to the guillotine, as you know, um, during the French revolution. Um, we do, you know, obviously the French revolution is going to play a huge part, um, in, in how art develops in France. Um, and, and some other events um, that you should take note of. Um, also, it's important to get an understanding of sort of the background to 18th century French painting. Um, there were these sort of um, academies that um, were set up. And so the French Academy, which you can also is referred to as the academies and um, acad academia exhibitions. Um, these were sort of salons that were established um, and sort of had these rules about art and artists. Um, and, and, and they were important, um, one, because French artists um, can no longer rely on the state um, for their patronage because um, Louis, King Louis had overspent, as we saw um, with the Palace of Versailles. Now artists are relying upon um, private um, patronage of the aristocrats and, and sort of upper bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie class. Um, they purchase and commission art as symbols of taste and status. Um, their expectations of art right now are concerned with, um, you know, this idea of pleasing and to, and to move emotions. Um, so it, it is important that you understand this concept of the French Academy um, and sort of why um, it was a fixture. So this idea of prestige, um, there was also this sort of public aspect of it. We'll look at an image of a salon, and this is where these sort of upper echelon and upper class people would come and not only look at art, but talk about, um, you know, other um, liberal arts as well. And then sort of this idea of patronage, um, sort of this idea of the private patron or sort of amateur art collector. Um, so again, you know, there is this middle class, you know, upper class, um, and then obviously art is not just for, for royalty and the very upper class um, society anymore. Um, some themes that we'll look at are wealth and leisure. Um, then we'll see a shift in, in sort of this idea of the enlightenment and sort of returning back to scientific observation. And then obviously art sort of used as a way to sort of reflect people's tastes um, and um, their, you know, their ideas. So here's an example of what uh, a gathering in one of these um, salons, um, you know, sponsored by the French Academy would have looked like. Um, so it was quite an affair and they, and they really, you know, you've probably been in a, an art gallery where they kind of hang things in a very, you know, sort of neat and orderly way. Here they sort of cram as many images as they can, um, you know, going up towards the wall. Um, obviously these were very social events as well. Um, it's also important that we kind of talk about the hierarchy of the genres of different um, paintings. We, we kind of talked about that when we were looking at Dutch Baroque art in our last segment. You know, there were artists who were, who were portrait painters. There were artists who focused on genre scenes. There were artists who did just landscapes. And there were artists who just did still life. And so this is sort of a category and hierarchy of, um, of what was considered the most prestigious. So history painting was considered sort of the highest genre. Um, this consisted of actions of God and man based on a text um, and 
you know, in some cases, you know, required imagination to sort of visualize these scenes. So history painting, um, you know, events in history, um, lesser genres, portraiture, genre scenes, um, and obviously some of these are based on observation of nature, um, required less imagination, um, landscape, and then still life. Another um, aspect that we want to go over again is this um, sort of um, style that, you know, most artists in France um, um, sort of align themselves with. So there was, there was an artist that we did not get a chance to talk about named Poussin, um, a French artist. Um, he, was, he was very much um, in, indicative of this idea of history painting and 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 so um, there are artists who sort of followed Poussin were called Poussinistas um, and they were very much um, um, part of the um, de Zagnol style of painting remember we, we looked at that when we started looking at high renaissance painting in Italy um, so they were very focused on line drawing sort of intellectual subjects um, um, and um, this idea of you know crisp line and sort of filling in the lines so Poussin. Ruben who we did talk about um, was more of a colorito painter so um, artists who followed him were called Rubenistas um, and again their emphasis in terms of technique in painting was color you know layering painting and coloring and and really you know instead of this sort of intellectual um, view of art they really wanted to have more of an emotional appeal as we saw again you know Ruben was a Baroque artist um, and then also we start to see this idea of um, the artist as a genius um, this is another sort of theme related to the identity of the artist that we'll, we'll start to see develop um, in later historical periods. All right. So here's an example of um, the interior or one of these um, salons um, where some of these um, um, academies um, sponsored by the French Academy um, might be held. Um, the interior of the salon is also decorated in an art style called Rococo. Um, and this is also translated as Late Baroque. Um, and this is an 18th century artistic movement and style affecting many aspects of the art, including painting, sculpture, architecture, um, interior design, as we're looking at in this case, um, you know, decoration, literature, music, and theater. It developed in the early 18th century in Paris, France, um, as a reaction against the grandeur, symmetry, and strict regulations of the Baroque, um, especially um, of the Palace um, Versailles. So remember when we were looking at um, French architecture and Baroque, it was a bit more restrained um, than some of the other um, regions um, where we saw Baroque art developing. You know, Italy was much more dramatic. Rococo artists and architects um, used a more jocular, sort of florid and graceful, um, jocular and florid, um, graceful approach to the Baroque. Um, their style was ornate. They used light colors, pastel colors. Um, they used a lot of asymmetrical designs, curves. Um, they used a lot of gold. <laughs> um, unlike the political um, Baroque um, that we had sort of seen that we have seen, um, the Rococo sort of had a playful um, and sort of witty themes. Um, the interior decoration of the Rococo rooms was designed as a total work of art, um, as you can see here with elegant ornate furnishings, um, small sculptures, ornate mirrors, um, tapestries, um, architecture reliefs and wall paintings. So you can really see um, how the whole room as, as a whole is, is sort of a work of art. The word rococo um, is seen as a combination of the French rocale, R-O-C-A-I-L-L-E, which translates as to stone, and coquilles, I'm probably saying this wrong, <laughs> C-O-Q, U-I-L-L-E-S, which um, translates into shell. 
um, due to the reliance of these objects as sort of decorative motifs, the term may have been a combination, um, the term may, so they sort of combine these two words. Um, the term may also be a combination of the Italian word barocco, which was uh, an irregular, sh or translates as an irregular shaped pearl, possibly the source of the word baroque, and the French rocali, um, a popular form of garden or interior ornamentation um, using shells, pebbles, I, I went over this earlier, and may describe and refine the fanciful style that became fashionable in parts of Europe in the 18th century. So anyway, just so you understand sort of the significance of the term Rococo. So as you can look, I think you can really see that um, this was a time of sort of daintiness, um, um, femininity, this sort of demureness, um, lots of pastel colors, and also it was a very kind of interesting time of flirtation. Women were in charge of these salons. Um, so again, we're looking at a very typical Rococo interior. It's smaller, it's a much more intimate space. Um, the use of mirrors sort of aid in this idea of flirting. Um, and definitely we'll, we'll be looking at themes of love making <laughs> and femininity. So here's a comparison of, um, hopefully you recognize this on the right. What is it? It's the Palace of Versailles, the Hall of Mirrors. And so definitely you can see how, um, you know, definitely the French are very ornate. Um, and there are some similarities, the use of gold. But definitely this room has a much more sort of um, intimate feel. Um, and whereas this room is so grand and, and sort of infinite with the repeated use of mirrors. So this is what Rococo painting sort of looks like. Um, you've probably seen it before. I mean, it definitely has a certain sort of style and um, characteristics about it. Um, this is a painting done by Fragnar. Um, it's referred to as the meeting um, from uh, a series he did called The Loves of the Shepherds between 1771 and 1773. Um, he was a French painter and printmaker whose late Rococo manner was distinguished um, um, by this sort of remarkable exuberance and, and also hedonism, you know, people sort of engaging in sort of less than ideal behavior. Um, Fragnard's um, scenes of frivolity and gallantry are considered the embodiment of what people think of as the Rococo um, spirit. In 1771, Frag. Um, Nard was commissioned to paint a series of panels um, for the Chateau uh, Lovacini's, um, the love nest of Madame Duberry, who was the beautiful mistress of Louis um, the Fifteenth. I know it's hard to keep track of all these Louis. Um, he, he, his assigned theme um, for this series was the progress of love. Um, and Fragnar um, selected to illustrate a variety of stratagems and tactics, tactics um, which lovers have always used in sort of this game of love. So these sort of strategies and tactics um, that sort of involve in courting and, and love making. Obviously, the meeting, usually a secret one, um, and always in a pleasant garden is a key element. So this is one of these sort of um, these sort of strategies um, in the idea and sort of this idea of courting and love. So in this image, we see the lovers, an earnest young man climbing up a ladder, and a willowy girl with flowers in her hair, and, and a, pl a plunging sort of um, décolletage, sort of plunging neckline, meet, presumably in secret. Their somewhat exaggerated poses are clearly inspired by this idea of contemporary theater and ballet. So this is, you know, remember all the arts, um, you know, had a sort of, were part of this Brococo movement. And both seem to be looking sort of off stage, so to speak as if they're fearful they'll be found out. It's almost like they heard something. 
Um, Fragnar builds this dramatic tension in a painting, a painterly love triangle formed by the couple and the statue of Venus um, um, taking Cupid's quiver of arrows that towers above them. So you definitely can see this sort of triangular composition and this sort of movement. Critics have made much of the upward thrust of the trees, um, maybe symbolizing it as the couple's desire is so evident that even the trees <laughs> appear aroused. Okay, I did not make this up. This is what um, art historians have written. Um, perhaps the way the tree split behind the statue is intended to um, let the viewer know that the resolution of their love is not yet um, decided. Here's a detail of the statue of Venus. So again, and also it's very, you know, there's lots of obviously interesting symbolism going on, but it's interesting too how the statue sort of presides over the scene. We'll look at some other details. Um, so again, here we can really see that sort of um, depiction of that moment of delayed anticipation um, where the lovers um, almost seem distracted as if they've heard something. Um, Madame du Barry rejected the cycle of painting in favor of another series in, in, this, in this new antique style, it's, it's neoclassical style, um, by another artist. So the Rococo sort of came in to fashion and sort of left very quickly as well, that even, you know, Fragnar, you know, this by the time he finished this cycle, um, Rococo was already out of style. Um, so, um, this is another one of um, Fragnard's um, paintings, and this is the one that we you do have to know for um, the AP 250 um, works that you're responsible for. This one is, is one of my favorites, and I actually do like the Rococo period. I think it's very charming and, and, and you know, kind of um, demure and sort of you know, just very much indicative of, of sort of 18th century sort of French courtly love. It's just interesting and sort of funny. And, and in some ways, I think some of this comes off as a bit hilarious um, to a modern viewer. So here we see, um, this is called The Swing. You've probably seen it before, and you've also seen it appropriated um, in, in, in movies. Um, I think the movie Frozen has sort of a reference um, to this painting, um, but it, it has been sort of appropriated um, into other paintings and other artwork and sort of other um, forms of art as well. Um, the painting depicts a young man hidden in the bush, bushes watching a woman on a swing being pushed by an elderly man, and he's almost hidden in the shadows um, and sort of unaware of, of, of the lover um, below. Um, the woman. As the lady goes up high on the swing, she lets the young man take um, sort of a peep under her dress. And so there's a sort of kind of coy sort of flirting going on, all the while flicking her shoe off in the direction of a statue of the Greek god of um, discretion or discretion and turning her back to the two angelic cherubs on the side of the older man. So again, there's lots of sort of interesting symbolism. Um, happening. The lady is wearing a berger hat, which was um, a shepherd, a shepherdess's hat, what a, um, a shepherd, um, a female shepherd would wear, which is ironic since shepherds are normally associated with this idea of virtue because of them living close to nature. Also the idea of Jesus being um, the good shepherd. Um, and, and also this idea that shepherds are uncorrupted by the temptations of the city. Here's a detail of it, and you, and you really do see this Rococo style, the sort of willowy figures, um, very dramatic poses, um, and these very kind of pastel colors and, and very feminine. Um, this painting was commissioned by the notorious um, French libertine Baron de Saint Julien as a portrait for his mistress. The swing was to be painted um, to the following spe specifications. Um, and he was quoted as saying, I should like you to paint Madame seated on a swing being pushed by a bishop. Um, while this odd request was turned down by other painters, um, 
and um, a painter of more serious historical subjects, um, Fragnar um, really leaped to the occasion, producing what became one of the most iconic works of um, French Rococo. We'll look at some other details. So here you see the gentleman sort of peeping under her dress. In the foreground, the playboy baron himself is depicted reclining in the lush shrubbery, one arm outstretched towards the maiden's skirt, his other arm holding his balance. He gave very specific instructions um, to Fragnar, stating, place me in a position where I can observe the legs of that charming girl. Um, the style, um, so the style of frivolous, wait, we have one more. Let's look at another detail. So here we look at sort of the older guy, um, probably her husband, who was sort of pushing her on the swing. Also, the, again, sort of these statues and other inanimate objects um, add to the story as well and have definite symbolism. We see two cherubs um, below the swing appear concerned um, by the sordid actions of the humans above them. So while he seems very unaware, you know, these two cherubs kind of seem like, oh my God, what's going on? one looking up at the woman in trepidation, the other looking away from the action as if he's embarrassed and sort of like being very judgy. Um, on the left side of the image is a stone statue of Cupid um, who raises a finger to his lips to point out the secret of nature of the impending affair. Let me go back and see if we can find that. So here, I'm sorry, I don't have a detail of it, but here's, so there's all this sort of like, innuendo and sort of this implied, um, you know, this implied sort of um, naughty behavior happening. The style of frivolous painting soon became a target of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, which is sort of another development that happens in the 18th century, who demanded a more serious art, which would show the nobility of man instead of, you know, men and women sort of acting silly. Um, but I do love this painting, and this is a very important painting because, again, it has been um, sort of absorbed and reinterpreted by other artists as well. So here is that juxtaposition. Here's the um, the example I talked about, um, you know, that from, from the movie Frozen. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but they're definitely referencing um, Fragnard's um, Rococo painting. Um, just to give you this idea of what I mean by appropriation as well, this is a, another, this is an artist that we will be looking at when we look at global contemporary art. Um, this was done um, by an artist. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite um, installations. So instead of a painting, um, he sort of, um, sort of recreated the swing and the sort of installation sculpture. Um, there are obviously some differences, and we'll talk about those when we actually talk about this work of art. Um, but anyway, this it's important that you understand, you know, the swing, um, the sort of original one, so that when we look at this one later, um, you can interpret it better. But definitely we'll start to see um, artists referencing artists, um, which we started to see happening with um, Michelangelo during the Renaissance, and we'll, we'll definitely see that um, move forward. Um, stay tuned for part two. We're going to be looking at neoclassical art. Um, so I hope I hope you enjoyed this.